Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this second episode, we're going to be focused on how do you begin a new project for XR. We're two episodes into our training series. Uh, the first episode was about thinking in XR, this episode being about new projects. Um, the homework was to take a vision and break it into the layers that we spoke about before. So think for yourself, what were those layers again? What was your environment? What was your object? What was your subject? In many cases, you may have multiple objects. You may even have multiple subjects. For a scene, you generally have one environment, but you can start to think about your vision now in a collection of pieces. So even though you really are thinking about this as a new project, you've already got some experience about how to take an idea and start to break it into parts. Because of course, from then it really is about going and collecting those parts. Additionally, you've talked about before, about like what is the user exploring? We're talking about some of the verbs around what are they gonna be looking inside of? What are they gonna be rotating and scaling? And so as we talk about our story, we think about like, well, what is it that the person is exploring? Um, and we're going to be then, of course, breaking down those layers. So let's take it back. A story is developing and you already know you want to use XR to tell that story. Maybe you have a vision for how you might even do it. So now what do you do? Welcome to your new project. First things first, take a pause and think holistically about all the things you can use in order to tell your story. You want to use your XR for what it's best at, but you also want to use all the other mediums that are at your disposal for what they do well equally. If you know you're trying to hook your user into exploring a story, use the headline or use the first place that you're gonna be reaching out to people to establish the story you want them to go through and to let them know there's something interactive waiting for them. Also, if there's a lot of names or written information that someone should know contextually about your story, you don't need to include all of the written information in that 3D scene. You can be establishing that either in the body of an article or in the captions of any 3D that you're putting out there. If you've got data that's necessary for someone to start to understand, unless the goal really is to make that data more accessible and more visceral to them, you know, if this is something you can communicate really clearly in just a chart or a graph, go ahead and do that. Put your straightforward data into the formats that they are already accepted and understood in. And then also, if you have uh, and also, if you have a lot of busy activity that was happening in your story, and as a beginner, maybe you're not ready to take on animating many characters all moving around the space, you can use video to really effectively have captured what was happening where and tell that full story back to your audience, and then let that audience explore that space in a calmer, more static 3D scene that you can assemble at your skill level. One of the things that we really like to do at Yahoo is to establish a strong goal for our XR. A couple example goals might be to really inspect a story rich object, an object that people maybe haven't gotten to see before. And there's a lot of detail that's already in that object that can be established both in context and in audio. And just by getting to hold it, rotate it, explore it, someone gets to go on a journey. Equally, you could actually then have someone exploring an immersive space or an immersive environment, letting themselves be somewhere in kind of an AR for VR layout where they get to go to a certain place and walk through it within their own space and get to have more of a moment in, in that story. Also, if it's not just about being somewhere, but it's about experiencing a certain situation, you can really be focused on the subject of your story and having you be with that subject in a situation that they live through. This could be a situation that's really exciting or really emotionally daunting, and you get to be either experiencing that story as though it was happening to you, or to be in that space bearing witness to the story as it unfolds and having a more visceral relationship and a more empathetic relationship. You get to be bearing witness to that story and having a more empathetic relationship with that subject. And one that's become a newer format which is to start thinking, how do I make complex data or data that doesn't feel innately human a bit more visceral in order to communicate a story? How can I show you how much money was spent in the 2020 election, and I could, but I couldn't visualize actually putting you in a room 
with these stacks of money that actually were spent? How can I visualize the spread of an outbreak around a, a country, but instead put you on that country and have you watch as the virus spreads out slowly across the map that you're standing on? There are a lot of types of data that are out there that in just a static chart or static graph may not actually effectively communicate what has unfolded and made it feel real and have an impact on the memory of someone who's experiencing that story. And XR can be really effective for doing that. Now, let's introduce what we're going to be doing over the course of this entire training. And that is we will be focusing on a group project that we will do through the videos while you also work on a personal project over your homework. The group project for this beginner course is going to be focused on the landing of the Perseverance Mars rover. In doing this, uh, it's going to involve thinking of the story, thinking of what we want to tell, thinking holistically, working with an editorial collaborator, and uh, then assembling this piece step by step as we work through the various videos in the series. Um, in order to do that, uh, as a group, we will be providing links to all of the assets in the video descriptions and the various uh, secondary materials that will go with this training series. Um, but beyond just, uh, you know, having you click and follow along, we also want to prepare you to work with editorial partners, with collaborators. And so for myself during this training, I will be working with my key collaborator at Yahoo, Laura Hertzfeld, who is the ex director of our XR partner program. So let's go ahead and take a second and we'll welcome Laura. Hi, Henry. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we're doing a thing around the Perseverance Mars lander. Um, do you have any questions about that so far? Um, I guess I'm just wondering what you've done so far. Like, have you, like, where is the editorial team right now on covering the Mars landing? Yeah, so we've got uh, one reporter who's kind of just working on like the how to watch and what the landing approach is going to be like. Um, I think we're also going to be doing like a short interview with someone who's actually working on the Mars rover team, and we're doing a video around that as well. That sounds great. Do you know if there's like additional materials from stuff that we've covered in the past? I know this is not our not our first Mars adventure, so just curious what we did for the last one. Uh, I think for the last one we had a lot of like three D graphics to kind of visualize things, but um, I. So we might be able to like learn from some of those. In this case, um, you know, since we're going to be doing an XR around it, I think we were really interested in kind of getting to just visualize the 3D rover itself um, and kind of talk about maybe some of the instruments on board. Um, yeah, I think that's where we're, where we're at so far. Awesome. And most importantly, uh, when's our deadline for this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's happening tomorrow. And so we really want to have this in the can by the end of the day today. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're moving quickly. Got it. Let's make it happen. Um, so I guess we're going to, I mean, like when I'm thinking about these things, I like to kick it off with like, why are we doing it in XR, which for space seems obvious, right? Yeah, there's nobody, there's no video people on Mars watching it come down. So we can tell a story there that uh, maybe video can't do always as effectively. Um, I guess my first thought is also like, are there assets available to us from NASA or JPL? Like, I know we've worked with them in the past a little bit and a lot of their stuff is open source. Yeah, I think that there will probably be assets on, on NASA JPL, um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's website. But we can also check out Sketchfab, because Sketchfab may have some of those there as well. They've been uh, taking things and working with NASA as well. So that might mean it's already converted to a file format we want to use. Okay. And when we think about this, I mean, I know we want like an image of the rover that you can move around and explore, you know, but what's like the narrative there? Where is this going to live within the story? Well, I guess there's stories, there's a bunch of coverage, right? So how is this going to live? It's going to look different in different pieces. Do we want it to live on its own in some places, like on social media? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, I think in the next few days, we can probably build out different versions for different places. I think for this very first one, we want to go to the door. It needs to be something that's probably evergreen enough. It can go into a few different ones so that we can get into all, like you said, the coverage of different stories. Um, I think if we build it simple, I think if we go with like a rover on like maybe a Mars terrain, if we can get something like that, um, maybe we can show like where on Mars it landed by using like a Mars uh, uh, planet model because I'm thinking like what might be out there right now. Um, those might allow us to kind of tell some, like connect some dots that the videos don't connect very well. Um, and then it, it, we can add on to it with stories around specific instruments or stories around the team that built certain instruments, the drivers. Um, but I think the first piece will probably be something that's a little bit more evergreen. It just lets you kind of explore it and maybe grounds you with like, what is it and where did it land? 
Yeah, I mean, I always like to kind of err on the side of simplicity and build from there with these projects. Um, but less is more, and you can always add to it. And I think that's one thing that you and I have learned over the course of doing this, especially something that's breaking news. It's like, let's get the object out there. Let's make it really relevant. Let's see how the audience react, reacts. And if it's a story that's continuing, then we can add to it. And we can think about what's the day two story. And that's maybe more you know, data driven or, you know, complex. Totally. So I think our first step will be like, let's go check out the libraries, uh, Sketchfab and TurboSquid, see what's already there. Um, do you have any idea what we might shoot, what we, else we should keep in mind besides just like producing the 3D part? Um, I know that sometimes we're thinking about like audio or accessibility, other things. Like what, what do you think we should be looking out for right now? Yeah, I think that's where I'm making a list of the content that's coming in. Like, who are the experts that we're talking to? Do we have additional access to them? Could they record some audio for us that goes with this? Are there images that are, you know, really um, high quality that we could, you know, put some 2D images in with the 3D to complement it? So really making a list of all the assets available to us, not just um, 3D assets. That makes sense. I'll have one of our reporters maybe do at least a voiceover to get us started, and then we can see if one of the experts can record something as well. Um, I think with audio, it's always like that can be the last thing that you add in and time it to stuff, but just knowing that that might really add a, a piece to it is, is good to kind of have in the back of your head as you're creating the narrative. Yeah, you can tell some of the story if someone's really new to the 3D and they're not sure what to do with it quite yet. Um, Obviously, we'll probably then need to put maybe a team together to do some closed captioning of that audio. Um, are there any things we need to worry about if, with the uh, with the accessibility concerns? You know, I think that's something where there's a lot of improvement that can be made in the immersive space. And so doing as much as we can right now with the technology that we have avail available is really important. So I think closed captioning, even just doing really detailed captions, not even closed captioning within it, but just captions or... Um, you know, a transcript of the audio that lives below the piece can be really helpful. Um, there's a lot of different methods that we have to approach that. I think having billboards within the content that you can read, but not too much writing because people don't read that much uh, in, well, generally, and in 3D, but um, but really being aware of, of what's available and how can you present that. And not always is it going to be um, the accessibility stuff within the project itself, but it can live within the page, within the story, and let people, you know, at least have some sense of what we're trying to do. Okay, that sounds great. So then, yeah, and then maybe if our platform is a little bit better in the future, maybe right now we'll also do like a visual description and like some alt text that's prepared. Exactly, definitely alt text. I mean, think about how you would do it with a photo and how a lot of the social platforms, Instagram and others, are now asking for alt text and building it into the process and whatever you can kind of port over into that immersive space, um, you know, is, is really important. Sounds great. Okay, cool. We'll go ahead and we'll get started on this one and we'll show you where we're at in a couple hours. Great. See you soon. Thanks. So let's recap what we took away from this meeting just now with Laura. Um, first, we can think really creatively about where we need to get our assets from. A big part of the next lesson will be going to 3D asset libraries that have kind of, um, assembled lots and lots of different 3D models in one place, but those libraries are not necessarily the only places you may find 3D models uh, that you can use for your production. NASA, as she mentioned, is a great source of 3D models, um, but depending on what you're working on, you may be able to get 3D models from architecture firms, from surveying organizations, from city governments. Um, it's really just a matter of asking and thinking who out there may have something that I might use in my project. Um, beyond thinking creatively about assets, we also talked about, well, what do we already have? What are we already doing as an organization in our holistic coverage that we might be able to then use for the XR? So uh, while this is just a demo project and we're not actually doing this production right now at Yahoo, we did this production like six months ago when we did it, um, you know, we knew we were interviewing scientists. We were already speaking with experts. We already had people who would be going on camera as storytellers and talking about what was happening. And we can use that same effort then to uh, work into assets for the XR. So if you need to get great audio, we can work with a partner then to uh, another uh, collaborator who can help us cut great audio from what they're already doing. Um, when it comes to uh, actually putting together the piece as a newsroom, we are on the a breaking news clock, right? We are trying to get our piece out within a news cycle, and then we will put out follow-up articles the next day, and the next day we'll cover the story from more perspectives 
as the story evolves. And so what I like to encourage beginners to do especially is try to publish a version, try to put a version out into the world that is your day one version. Um, it may take you two or three or a week or five, you know, a little more than that in your very first production as you kind of stumble your way through the initial skills. But be quick to share the most basic version of your story. And then as you pick up new skills or as you recognize new stories that could uh, attach on to that related to what you've already done, you put out your version twos, you put out your version threes. You find out from your version one, what is it that resonates with people? And then instead of assuming you already have now learned and heard from them what resonates, you can make your version two and your version three story uh, with many of the same assets, just kind of building on top of it. Um, but you know then it's leaning into what uh, what they're going to engage with, what has worked well with them so far. Uh, we're going to make sure we, we use a solid audio. We've mentioned that before. But to say, you know, well, where is the story and is looking at this object? Well, we can use the audio to tell you more of a story and to help guide your attention uh, as you explore these 3D objects or you explore this object in your space. And then we're going to focus on really considering your whole audience. Sometimes you may just have a certain part of your audience in mind and you're forgetting there are people who uh, may not be listening to it because they're on the subway. They may be not be listening to it because they're hard of hearing. They may be distracted and so they're not seeing every detail, but you may want to describe to them some of the details that might be missing if they're not looking at the whole part. Or maybe they're struggling with rotating the object and at the same time you want to make sure that they know what they're missing out on. Um, you want to make sure that you are trying to provide the story to reach accessibly everybody who might be interested in it. Um, and that just means, you know, being proactive about what additional assets you put together in the production of your XR. So with that said, uh, we have a bit of a plan that we discussed with Laura around what stories are we out there, what stories we think we could try to do in day one. Um, and so let's focus for a moment on the uh, its landing story, a quick one day scene of um, the 3D asset of the, of the Mars rover landing on Mars. The first thing you need to do is document your plan. I am not a list maker by my nature, but I know when I'm working with other people or I want to be able to give myself a clear set of steps that I need to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to list all of the likely 3D models that I want to collect for this production. Um, and so I'm going to physically make a list and I'm going to say, okay, um, from this list, I'm going to need uh, like a rover and I'm going to need uh, maybe a Mars planet and I'm going to need um, maybe the Mars surface. Um, and I may not know everything else I need from there, but I'm thinking what are at least the minimum ones I need to search for um, and I need to be specific. Um, after I make that list, I also want to draw a mock-up, which is a front-facing image and a top-down image. Um, and we'll talk about why we do that in a moment, but we also need to create a skeleton scene. Um, you don't necessarily need to, but it can be really useful. And we'll, we'll introduce more of you guys to Blender um, in episode four, but uh, we will open it in a moment. I'll show you the quick as uh, aspect of building a skeleton scene that can go into Blender. And so once you've gotten through some of your training and seen in episode four, you'll understand immediately like what was the value in doing this and how to do it yourself. Um, so talk, drilling into each of those really quickly, listing your likely components um, is a way of taking now the layers that you had already spoken about um, around, okay, what is my subject? Well, my subject might be um, a 3D scan of somebody. If, I can, if I'm in person with them and I can get them to consent to 3D scanning and they're open to being a part of the story, then maybe I 3D scan them. You'll learn more about how to do that in episode eight. Um, but if I can't do that, there are gonna be photographs of the scientists that we're working with or photographs even of the reporters or yourself as a storyteller that you may then take those photos and put a cutout, which we will talk about more, I believe in episode six, um, about how do you then make a character that you put into the story to provide a sense of scale and to put a face to the, to the names and to the audio that is bringing together the whole story. Um, objects, well, I, I probably need my Perseverance rover. I probably need my planet. Environment, well, the environment we're talking about is the thing that holds the scene together. And I could maybe think of something really advanced, a cool Martian surface, and we'll go searching for it. But if we don't find it, when in doubt, I can always just you know, place some of my objects on a floor 
that we then make look like the Mars surface with photographs of, of the Mars dust from this rover or another rover. Um, audio, we can have reporters who are describing the mission, describing the landing. Um, we can have scientists who are describing some of the instruments or some of the mission that they're trying to undergo. Um, so you already sort of see, okay, these are the things that over the coming days or hours I need to collect in order to assemble my 3D project. Um, I really encourage you, as you make your list, be specific. So for example, don't say I need a kitchen. Say I need a table and a counter and chairs and a sink and cabinets and a fridge. Think about the parts of the kitchen. You might go searching for kitchen and maybe you'll get lucky. But in many cases, you may need to be searching for the individual components of that thing that you will then bring together and you'll position them all to make the kitchen of your dreams and not uh, just what's out there. Uh, and then from there, you know, we need to go search. In the next video, we're going to talk about how you go searching libraries to try to find what you can find. But remember, if you can't find something, that means you have two choices fundamentally. You need to uh, make it. Well, you have three. You have to make it. You have to pay someone to make it for you. Or you need to adapt your vision to uh, not need it anymore. And so this list is something that fairly quickly then as, as you go searching in the next episode, you'll find, can I find these things? Can I not find these things? Um, and then you just keep adjusting your vision based on what you found and what you didn't find. After you've made your list, the next step though is to draw your mock-up images. I am not an artist. And so I hope that you feel, will feel comfortable going along with me right now as we draw some mock-up images. Um, what you're gonna need to do for your mock-ups is a minimum of two images per XR scene. Um, the front facing image is gonna communicate the starting perspective generally of your audience. It is the view that you want them to first look at your scene from. It may not always be exactly front facing and so maybe in a moment I'll drop three mock-up images, but uh, you wanna have front facing and you wanna also then have um, a top down view. The top down view will communicate to a partner, a collaborator, the relative position of the various assets in relationship to each other. Um, it'll also help you kind of visually understand, well, what might be revealed as someone rotates that's not initially visible in their first perspective. Um, and so um, if you have uh, a lot of things on your project, you may need to draw more images. If you have a lot of key angles you want people to hit, or if you have uh, in more advanced projects, you need to visualize animations or interactive um, objects, you may need more images from there. Um, but really quickly, let's go ahead and we'll draw the mock-up images for the Mars scene that we're working on. Uh, and I'll put this, I'll draw three images even. We'll start with what kind of the starting perspective I want to be is. So um, let's say I have this um, floor that's going to be like my Mars surface. And if I can get something more advanced than that, we'll go for it. But otherwise, we'll at least have a flat, we call it plane, um, that we'll go ahead and we'll put stuff on top of. Uh, and then I want to have my, probably my Mars rover right in the middle of the scene. Uh, and the Mars rover will just say kind of looks like this. Uh, and I think it has like a little head on it over here. I think it has a little arm on the front or something. Um, but here you can probably see uh, kind of where my Mars rover is gonna go loosely. Um, and then uh, I wanna have like a Mars planet. If we're talking about where it's landing and that it's landing, um, I maybe I'll actually put like a sphere of Mars and then to show right where it lands, maybe we'll put a pin in Mars. So I hadn't originally considered in my list, oh, maybe I need a pin or I need something to symbolize where it's landing. And so either I can search for a pin or we'll actually in the next step should show you how you can very easily make a pin um, because it's such a simple set of, of shapes. Um, but this is, this is maybe my starting perspective. So this is maybe how I want people to look at it from the very first glance. Um, once I have my starting perspective, I would take a photograph of that, and then we'll go on to our front facing. The front facing really helps our collaborator know, and just ourselves, where do I want to put everything? So I've got, you know, my flat plane now is perfectly flat, and I have a tire and a tire, and then I got the body of the rover. I think, again, I think it has a little head thing. I think it has like a little arm thing or something that sticks out. Um, and then we'll have, again, our Mars. Uh, and then we'll have a little pin, but from front facing, it'll just be like a little like dot. So this then is our front facing perspective. From working with the collaborator, they now understand, oh, the Mars is floating up and kind of 
above into the corner of the body of the rover. And so they can now see positionally what the relative heights are and what the relative positions are. They can see that the tires are right there on the ground. Um, they can get a sense of what they're working with from that view. But because we're working three-dimensionally, we also then need to do a top-down view. So with our top-down, we're going to then, again, have start with our floor. And so we've got our floor plane that goes down. We're going to show our rover again. So our rover body is kind of here. And it's kind of got like little six tires or whatever. Um, and then it's got a head. And I think the arm comes forward a bit, but I'm, I'm not sure. We'll find out when we look at the models that we find. Um, and then we will also have our planet. Our planet being here and the little pin that sticks out of it. And it has its little pin head on it. And so with this layout, we can now see, oh, the collaborator can look and go, oh, the Mars is pushed back a bit. Maybe it's back in the back corner um, and that the pin is kind of forward facing. So maybe if they saw the front piece and they also saw the head before, they're like, well, what is that? And then they can see that's, oh, that's the pin head and the pin body is going back into the tip. Um, and they can see now my Mars rover is positioned in the middle of the floor and not maybe in the front or in the back. So this is why we want to always do at least two, the front facing the top down. If you do another perspective shot to kind of show that first glance, that can be useful as well. But you need to have at least these two front facing and top downs in order to effectively work with someone on your vision. So having done our mock-up images, we take photographs of each of those, we codify it so that you know we can share that on a document. Um, but if you're a bit more advanced, what you'll then do is you'll go on to make an XR skeleton scene. Um, and so in this, we would use our 3D editing software um, to create a template of our scene. We will not be going over Blender until episode four, so I don't expect to follow along at this stage, um, although you will be able to download this skeleton scene um, in the uh, files below. There should be a link for this, or it'll be included in the accompanying episode two skeleton scene blend. So you'll be able to go back and look at this after the fact. But here in Blender, then, we will take a look at our 3D software for the very first time. Um, this is probably a bit intimidating to you as we haven't gone over how to use it yet. But in Blender, we can see that it starts with just a cube, a camera icon, and a light icon. We are going to delete off all of those because those are not what we're trying to use right this second. So I'm going to select them, right click, and delete. And then all you need to know at the moment is we're going to be using the primitives, um, which are the basic fundamental shapes to create our project. You add primitives by coming over to this add button and we're going to choose add mesh, which is the name of an object. Uh, it's, a, it's a term of art and industry, but mesh. And then you can see plane, cube, circle, sphere, icosphere, which is just two different types of spheres, cylinder, cone, and torus, which is like a donut shape. Um, and so based on our mock-up images from a moment ago, I need a floor plane to place my objects on. So if I click add plane, here we have then a plane that we've put down. Um, maybe we don't know our exact sizes yet, but that's fine. Um, we can say, okay, there's my plane. Next, I'm going to add a cube. This is just the cube will just symbolize where the rover will go. Um, this cube is obviously larger than the plane already, so that could be a bit of a problem. In uh, episode four, you'll learn about using our scaling tools. So I will, right off the bat, though, uh, just click on the scaling tool, and we're going to resize this to kind of resemble the size of our rover. And then, I think the rover's a bit thinner. And then we will use our move tools, which we'll go over all of in episode four, to kind of say, okay, there's my rover. And then finally, uh, I'm going to add my planet by saying add we're going to use a UV sphere, which is a cleaner looking sphere than the icosphere, which can be intimidating to some people. Um, and I'm going to, once again, rescale this down. And I'm going to move it into position over the corner of my rover. And this is a skeleton scene. It doesn't need to be more complex than this. Um, often during, as you build this, you will go ahead and maybe you'll rename stuff so people know that, okay, this is not cube. I can double click on it and say, this is now a rover. Um, I can click on the plane and I can rename that to, uh, Mars surface. And then I can click on my sphere and I can call this, uh, Mars planet. Um, and so just from this alone, I can kind of go, all right, this is the general layout I'm going for. 
as I build my project. And then with this skeleton scene in place, as I go and download 3D assets that we're going to put into this, I can just import them and build right over this project, dropping them into place. Um, and this is now a working starting file that I can use. I can just you know come over here and now press save as and save this as the beginning of my project. And again, you'll be able to find this file in the episode two skeleton uh, dot blend. That's all for this particular episode. Your homework for episode two is I want you to take the story that you came up with from homework one with the various layers you had in mind and now list out the likely components that you need to go search for that we'll do in the next episode. We then need you to go ahead and draw your two mock-up images of your XR scene, your one front facing and one top down. And you know we didn't do that during ours, but feel free to just write labels describing what is what. You can just write the word rover next to the rover. You can write the word planet next to the, the circle that you draw. It doesn't need to be perfectly visible. You can just leave those notes. And then go ahead and test if someone can understand you know, your mock-up. If you have someone who you live with or who's close to you, uh, someone who you can share a screenshot with, um, even with your labels in place, just kind of send it to them and say like, hey, do you understand if I said like, this is the rover and this is the planet, this is the surface, then you could look at this document and understand where everything is relative to each other. That's the goal for your skeletons. That's the goal for your mock-ups is to say, if I show this to somebody else, could they understand it and work with me? Um, and it could, that also mean that in a few, if, if you have some time between the start of your project and the next time you work on your project, could you look back in your notes and immediately understand what you were trying to communicate back then? That's the goal. Um, and that's the goal for your homework then. So with that, uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next episode where we will talk through searching libraries for the assets that you've listed as necessary for your project. And I will see you then.